Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the response of the endocrine and neuroendocrine system to uh, stresses. This gives us a physiological rationale for how illnesses and disease end up developing because it's not really being exposed to a distinct pathogen as it is the culmination of endocrine and neurological changes. When we talk about this, we have to talk about the fact that stresses lead to health issues. When we talk about stresses, we're basically talking about two distinct types of stresses, the physical stress and the psychological stress. The problem is, is that we cannot physiologically distinguish between whether the stress here is being physical, being imposed upon us, or psychological, where we're thinking that we have a stress that we have to deal with. Either way, we're going to have a stress that threatens homeostasis. Any increase in stress, once we have a sense of stress occurring, will take us from a state where we might be able to resolve, get back to homeostasis with any issues occurring. But since we have additional stress there, we're going to end up having an increased risk for overall health issues. In this response to stress, we have to look at it as a design and attempt to maintain homeostasis by eliminating the stress. In this case, it's all about whether or not the hypothalamus is going to recognize the stress that's being occurring as an stress. Seely gave us a term that we can utilize to, re to give us an understanding for this response. It's referred to as the general adaptive syndrome response or the gas response. And it's, it begins with an increase of sympathetic activity followed by a change in inflammatory in anabolic hormones. So let's take a look at SEALS gas or general adaptive syndrome response. The theory here is that we have a triphasic response to stress. The triphasic response to stress is an interaction between the neuroendocrine and the sympathetic nervous system and their individual responses to stress, in which we break it up into three distinct phases, or the triphasic response. The alarm phase, which is the acute response, the resistance phase, the moderate term response, and then the exhaustion phase, which is the long term response and illnesses and disease do not occur until we get to that exhaustion point. So let's take a look at alarm. You can think of alarm as a fight or fight response. In terms of it's, an, it's the autonomic nervous system, in particular the sympathetic nervous system, causing changes to the metabolism of the body. We also have initiation of the hypothalamic <coughs> pituitary adrenal axis, or the HPA axis, which is going to trigger an inflammatory response. So let's take a look at how this plays out. We have a stress, and once again, we can't distinguish whether it's coming from the brain, coming from some sort of pathogen or coming from some sort of physical stress, something that we're imparting on the body. This causes the hypothalamus the pituitary to release norepinephrine and to stimulate the, via the posterior pituitary the adrenal medulla to release epinephrine. This triggers the alarm response. The alarm response mobilizes glucose to be used by immune cells mobilizes free fatty acids and triglycerides to be used by every other type of tissue, and it changes the cardiovascular and the respiratory responses that we see. The alarm phase is set up in such a way as to localized and specific in an attempt to protect the area where we have the stress occurring 
or lead to an avoidance of further stress. This is going to be in an acute and an immediate response. And the inflammatory response that we see is going to be minimal. On the other hand, if we cannot take care of the stress during that alarm phase, then we get into what's, what's referred to as the resistance phase. The resistance phase is where the body changes its metabolism, in particular its energy metabolism, in an attempt to resist the stress, hence the name resistance phase. So if we look at it, the stress is still there. We haven't been able to get rid of the stress. Because we haven't been able to get rid of the stress, a secondary set of hormones get released. In this case here, we're going to follow the cortisol release. So we have CRH going to the anterior pituitary, stimulating ACTH, which stimulates cortisol release. Cortisol and epinephrine combine together to prolong the alarm phase leading to what's referred to as resistance. In resistance, we're going to have even larger amounts of freeing up of glucose, amino acids, and triglycerides for use as energy sources or fuel sources in various tissues. In order to get to the amino acids and to the triglycerides, we're going to end up having to break down protein as well as lipids from skeletal muscle as well as from adipocytes. The change of cortisol and the change of epinephrine signaling along with the change in interleukin and cytokine releases is going to alter leukocyte and lymphocyte functioning leading from a localized tissue disturbance to a generalized tissue disturbance what we end up getting is we end up getting a greater inflammatory response and an overall alteration of metabolism in some cases we can get an of feeling that something is off. This is where we might have an aching in a muscle or an aching in the joint from exercise or where we might feel like, oh, I'm coming down with something. Hopefully at this point in time, we've eliminated enough stress that the stress has been nullified and we can get on with our normal function. However, if we cannot eliminate the stress or we have subsequent stresses being imposed upon the body, then we get into the exhaustion phase. The exhaustion phase is the long-term health implication phase. This is due to chronic changes in hormone production as well as chronic changes in hormone responsiveness due to a continual level of some sort of stress on the body. This is what's going to lead to a dysregulated state, a diseased state, or a distressed state. We do not get illness and we do not get disease until we reach this phase of the triphasic response. Within this, we are trying to constantly undergo repair while undergoing breakdown at the same time. And usually what is that breakdown outdoes repair. So, we still have the stress there. The stress is still causing the alarm phase, it's still causing the resistance phase. Nothing has changed, which means that we have an ever-increasing level of inflammatory signals. This ever-increasing level of inflammatory signals leads to excessive tissue breakdown and excessive alteration of energetics and a metabolic dysregulation. And we go from having a generalized response to having a systemic global response. It's the systemic global response that leads to the diseased state. It is not an exposure to a pathogen, it is not an exposure to a stress. It's the fact that we have so much tissue breakdown that everything is undergoing an inflammatory response. This is where we have happen to be having the flu and we feel achy all the time. We have a, a change in going from hot flash to cold flash 
within a single day. Unfortunately, it's very hard to alleviate the stress in the exhaustion phase. In the exhaustion phase, the only, me only mechanism that we have to get back to a homeostatic balance is through a pharmacological or a behavioral modification. So what we have to remember here is that in our response to stresses, we're attempting to get back to a homeostatic balance, which means that just because we have a stress or just because we're exposed to a pathogen doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get an illness or we're going to get a disease. We don't get that until we reach the exhaustion state of the triphasic response. If at any point in time within the response to the stress, minimize any other type of stress, we minimize the risk of getting into either the resistance phase or into the exhaustion phase, which is why whenever we have periods of high stress, we have to find a way in order to reach some sort of relaxation.